Good morning, everybody. I was talking to Carol Ann before uh, service began, and we were saying, you know, in theater, one of the things that they say is, uh, you never want to follow uh, animals or children. <laughs> and uh, ministry is is Hollywood for ugly people, so we uh, we follow the we follow the same principles. That was lovely. Um, <laughs> And I just want to personally welcome you all here. Benvenidos. It's lovely to have you here uh, sharing your gift and your talent with us uh, on this day. And you know, it was a um, really beautiful song about belief. And I kind of want to play with that word if I can, because you know, we may all be coming from different traditions. And they bring us here. And often those traditions are built about the things that we believe. But one of the things that I just want to invite us to consider is this, is that um, when it comes to the spiritual path, beliefs aren't terribly necessary. And, And sometimes they can even be a bit cumbersome. Gosh, look at that. He's gone 30 seconds and he's already a heretic. (laughs) But let us consider this. Let's define what we're talking about. What is a belief? So for me, I consider a belief or I define a belief as a habitual thought. We have a thought and we experience an outcome and then we become convinced uh, that that is correct and then something will stimulate or trigger this, and then we'll have that same thought, and sure enough, there we are arriving at this belief. And beliefs are kind of interesting because the more we ponder this thing, the more habitual it becomes, it's literally rewiring our brain. There are specific neural pathways that are then being developed. And that those pathways then begin to influence how we perceive things as they are. And it kind of becomes a loop, does it not? Because we perceive things the way they are, and that reinforces the habitual thinking that we're having, which therefore creates the perception of what we're doing and on and on and so forth. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But it's something just to pay attention to because sometimes, sometimes our habitual thinking can get in the way, particularly when it comes to ideas or habitual thoughts that we may have about ourselves, right? So um, the other thing about beliefs that I just want to kind of dive into here is this, is that often beliefs will create a sense of separation rather than bringing us together. Dr. Martin Luther King used to say that the most segregated hour in the country was Sunday morning at 10 a.m., right? Because we're all saying, thank you, God, that we're not like them. So I want to kind of play with all of that because my my topic today is, what, shine, something like that? Um, What is my talk title? I'll look it up here, bear with me just a second. I know I'm going to get to it. Let's see, it's in here someplace. Anyway, it's about shining and authenticity and and all that other kind of stuff, which is good stuff to have. (laughs) But what I, I want to talk about clouds, but I want to talk about what it means to shine not necessarily in the dark, but in the unknowing. Uh, When we let go of our beliefs, because another thing about beliefs is this, we actually believe them. (laughs) And we actually believe that we are what we're thinking and what we're believing. But what I would offer uh, the mystics teach is someone particularly like Thomas Merton would say, that the belief that we hold about ourselves and the beliefs that dominate our perception really have more to do 
with the false self than the true self. And so um, sometimes beyond belief are other things. There's a story uh, that uh, Martin Luther, not Dr. Martin Luther King, the, the other Martin Luther, uh, the one who started Lutheranism. Uh, doctor, uh, not doctor, but Martin Luther King, friar, brother, whoever. So he was asked once, what would you do if you knew the end of the world was imminent? What would you do if you knew the end of the world was imminent? And, you know, I invite you to just kind of ponder that thought yourself. If someone was to tell you that the end of the world was imminent, right around the corner, what would you do? His answer was that he would plant a tree. He would plant a tree. Because sometimes hope is an act of defiance, right? Yeah. <laughs> because it often has nothing to do with what we believe, but really something else. And that's what I want to talk about today. But I want to frame it into a, something that is going on today with our, our brothers and sisters who come from the different Christian traditions. Today is the Feast of Pentecost, or it's also called Whit Sunday or White Sunday. Anybody, anybody know what Pentecost is? Good, a couple people here, they're good. So Pentecost is a very interesting, interesting um, event. It's, uh, it's uh, seven weeks, 40 days-ish after Easter. And as the story goes, and it's a really kind of an interesting story, um, about nine days prior to this in a whole liturgical calendar. And, and liturgical calendars are kind of interesting because they just allow us to kind of fall into rhythm with something. But there's this wonderful story that uh, after, after the time of uh, the resurrection and after the time of uh, Jesus being with his disciples, there was a time where he's with his disciples and he's, um, he's uh, talking with them and exhorting them, and they're very sad because they realize he is going to go. And they ask him, you know, different questions, but one of the questions they ask him is, when will the kingdom come? When will everything transform? When will it be, you know, that, that uh, justice will flow? Goodness shall be here, and peace upon the earth. And Jesus' answer was, it's not for you to know. And as the story goes, then he is, he is taken up into the clouds. And uh, the, the disciples are standing there, and, and, and this, as the story goes on, there's these angels that show up, and they're kind of saying to them something to the effect like, uh, what are you gawking at? Don't you have something else to do? And, and I think that that's kind of an important thing. You know, it's interesting because uh, in Thomas Merton, there's a story um, that um, James Finley, who wrote a beautiful book on, on uh, the, not necessarily the life of, of Thomas Merton, but really about how his spirituality, it's called The Palace to Nowhere. And the, the story is told that Finley, who, was, uh, who studied under Thomas Merton, was, was asking him one day all these great, deep, mystical questions and Thomas Merton's answer was, uh, how are the cows that you're taking care of? How are they doing? How's that garden going? In other words, we, we so want to get into the, the juice of these great, deep, mystical truths. But kind of like the exhortation of Jesus at this, at this time, and kind of like Thomas Merton, or kind of like um, the Zen question, you know, a Zen student goes to his master, and he's new there, and he says, I'm, I'm new here. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I'm really wanting to grow as a Zen monk. What should I do? And the monk says, well, have you had breakfast? And he says, yes. And he says, well, then go wash your dishes. <laughs> 
You know, it's, it's the little things that begin to create the momentum. There's the old saying in, in Latin that says, uh, lex ordinae, lex vivende, which means that as we pray, we live. And so we do it in these kind of most ordinary things. But I want to circle back for a second, if I can, to this incredible story of, of Pentecost, but, but this, this ascension story that is told, because it's rooted in another story, which is the story of the transfiguration. And the story of the transfiguration is that, um, that at one point in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is with, was with his disciples, and they go up to this mountain, and they're caught into this cloud and in this cloud, there's radiance, and there's beauty, and there's voices that are saying, this is my beloved son, listen to what he says, and, you know, and there's great wisdom. And um, that is representative of something that goes on in the Hebrew poetry and myths and legends of the Old Testament, which is clouds are used in interesting ways. Because sometimes we are engulfed in these clouds, and there's incredible insight and wisdom. We are literally taken up into the realms of the divine. And other times we're taking in, up into these clouds and there are no answers. They're the clouds of unknowing. And so clouds can reveal and clouds can conceal. So what am I getting at here? What I'm getting at is this, is that more important than beliefs is our capacity to imagine. Because when we imagine, we can step out of our beliefs into a new possibility. Pierre Théard de Chardin says that the divine lives in the present moment and in the moment of possibility, and is always luring us into that future sense, that sense of, of how things are possible. And we enter into that through the imagination. So um, for those of you who know me, and, and here it is 10 minutes in my talk, and now I'm going to be quoting Tolkien after Tehard, <laughs> right on schedule, but there's this great part in... Uh, <laughs> There's this great part in the Lord of the Rings um, where uh, the, 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 the Fellowship of the Rings have set out on this incredible adventure, and they're, they're trying to take this certain mountain pass through Cardetras, this, this mountain range, and there's this huge battle that goes on through the night, and they're covered in snow, and it's getting deeper and deeper, and they just, they're just not able to move forward, and someone turns to Gandalf and says, you know, hey, Mr. Wizard... <laughs> Why don't you light a fire? Why don't you do something here? And Gandalf's answer is, even wizards need material to work with. And, and what I want to offer that is just as a consideration is this, is that um, for us to work the wizardry of the imagination, we need material to work with. So the question then becomes, what feeds your imagination? How do you nurture your imagination? There's, um, there's one, of my, one of my favorite books is, a, is by an author by the name of Robert Sardillo. The book is called Freeing the Soul from Fear. He talks about fear as almost like a viral infection that kind of comes into us. And when we experience trauma, when we experience fear, uh, when, we, when we engage in these things, what he says is that what will happen is that our imagination will flatline. We go into survival mode. And the thing about survival mode is there's no novelty in it. There's, no, there's, there's nothing new when we are trying to survive. And so the real curative work, dealing with anxiety, dealing with trauma, dealing with fear, the real curative work is to engage the imagination, color, Nature, music, those things. There's a, there was a, a couple of reports in the New York Times this week and then someplace else, I can't remember where. Um, I, I shouldn't qualify something important by saying, well, hell, I don't know where I got that. 
I read the New York Times and I read Washington Post and something else, I don't know. But, um, but they talk about these ideas of green zones and blue zones. And what's really cool is, I know where I got it, it was from a lecture by uh, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, but he, they talk about this initiative that's happening in the, in, in the world right now. Uh, one of them is called 30 for 30, and the next one's 50 for 50, whereas, and California is participating in this, by the way, that says by the year 30, 2030, 30% of the land in California will be rewild. Re and they're also talking about that in the oceans, that 30% of the ocean will be rewild. And then by 2050, 50%. But, but I say that because there's this sense of being in the forest, being at the ocean, watching clouds. Have you watched these cloud formations that happens or sunsets? These things bring us to that place of amazement wonder and awe. We enter into either the cloud of knowing or the cloud of unknowing. The cloud of unknowing is not the cloud of doubt. It's the cloud of possibility. Because both of those are tools that bring us into the mystery. And again, to shine in the unknowing. Because I think one of the things that I am learning personally is this, is hope works best when the outcome is not known. And sometimes the known has a withering effect on the soul. And I think that that's the danger of the world that we live in today, is it's trying to convince us all that the future is known, you know, apocalyptically or this, that, or the other thing, or whatever the case may be. And, and what if we could enter into the cloud of unknowing and allow ourselves the imagination of possibilities which are not tainted by uh, nihilistic, um, materialistic, pseudo-spiritualistic, or you name it, kinds of ideas about these possibilities. What if we could be comfortable in the unknown? And there, we simply plant a tree. Something that I've been kind of um, sitting with, and I want to qualify this if I can, is that um, I love new thought. I love being an ordained minister of New Thought. I am committed to New Thought. I've been in ministry almost 20 years. And don't see myself going anyplace, anywhere else, you know, in the near future. But my love of our teaching does not simply cloud over some things that I, I wrestle with. And I think part of developing an imagination is, is also developing kind of this art of discernment, or maybe even sometimes critique. And let me, let me say what, what I mean on that. I think that there's one thing that, or two things, there's probably three, but I'm gonna just talk about two, uh, where sometimes we can get kind of lost in it. And the first one is this, is the sense of self-absorption. And what I mean by self-absorption is we, we start thinking that it is our spiritual path, our manifestations, our consciousness. Look what I can do. Look what has happened to me kind of thing. And it's a story that is very small. Because the reality is we are the sum of all the experiences that have happened to us and our ancestors. And it is all alive within us in this moment. There's another, there's a, this other part in um, The Lord of the Rings that's a wonderful, wonderful story of Frodo and Sam as they are marching through the dark lands of Frodo. And they're having this conversation. 
that they are part of a story that has been told for eons before them. And that the story is being lived through them and in time will be told to others who will be living the story. And that is true for each and every one of us, right? Is that we are, we are part of a story that is greater than ourself that is being told through us. That by the way, the end is not known. But the question is, what are we doing in the story now? How are we reacting to the story? How are we responding in how the story is being told through each and every one of us? And part of that um, uh, is uh, another thing that I think can be dangerous for us in New Thought, and that is um, we, we don't know what to do with suffering. Now, I was having a conversation with a minister friend of mine a while back, and, and one of the things that we were talking about is, you know, that, that there's only one thing that Dr. Holmes really talks about where he says, um, you know, that, that suffering will be unnecessary. I respectfully disagree, you know, and would qualify that, that Dr. Holmes said that when he was a young man, barely 30. That was before his wife died. That was before he noticed or observed or witnessed the separation of the beloved community that he had created, or that he had a serious physical illness, and began to sing a new camp tune. James Baldwin writes this. He says, um, I don't want to be too sentimental about suffering, but who cannot suffer can never grow up, can never discover who they are. Because, you know, the beauty of, not the beauty of suffering in the sense of, isn't this a wonderful thing, but the sense that it distills down the essence of who we are. And then after that, it distills down sort of the irrelevance of the false self. And then we become teachable then we are open to another new thought. Then we mature. Then we begin to, again to realize that we are part of something that is greater than ourself. And I think in that, there's also the next phase, which is this, is how are we in the world? Well, I, I really don't have an answer for us as an organization to who and what we should be doing in the world. I, I don't even, I'm not even sure I would even know how to even talk about what your own personal spirituality should be and how it should be organized or what you should do as a spiritual community or who you are with your family. I don't have any of those answers. But I just invite you to consider these words from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is one of my favorite theologians, uh, one of those public theologians uh, that was alive during the Second World War. In fact, he was assassinated by the, the, the Nazis. He actually fled Germany before the, before, he was one of the first to critique, uh, critique Hitler's rise to power. He was one of the first to critique the church that aligned itself with the nationalist movement. And he used to ask the question when the Holocaust and all these other things were going on, where is the church in all of this? So he came to the United States, was totally taken with black spirituality, and went back to Germany because he said he couldn't participate in the reconstruction of Germany unless he also participated in the suffering of Germany, uh, was captured and killed. But one of the things that he wrote is this. He says, your yes to God requires your no to all injustice, to all evil, to all lies, to all oppression and violation of the weak and the poor. So we'll just put that on our work table of our imagination of what is possible. When will, the, when will it come? There's so many things we don't know. But what if we anchor our imagination on this? that this, um, this fallen race in this broken world, in this very incomplete universe that we live in, 
is being lured into a possibility of justice. Now, it's kind of a tough call for us. Karen Armstrong writes this. She says this. She says, um, when we confront the huge pain of the world, we are up against a dark mystery. We are in what the mystics have called a cloud of unknowing and should not expect to see a silver lining immediately. So what do we do? We plant a tree. We do our dishes. We do the things that we are called to do that may seem very insignificant, but in no small way they build on something. We participate in an imagination that we are a part of a story that is unfolding and that we happen to be that idea in time and space. As our founder, Dr. Holmes, says, each and every one of us is a center of divine consciousness within the vast whole. Now that's something to consider. You and I are centers of divine consciousness within this vast whole that there's possibility in us. So there's many things about new thought that people ask, you know, what are you guys all about? And uh, if, I was, if I was to distill it, it would come down to two things, I think. One is the university of all, of all beingness in God. And what I mean by that is I don't think God is terribly petty about what we believe or don't believe, but is inviting us to participate in something that is greater than ourself. And the second thing is this, is that thoughts are causative. Thoughts create beliefs. Thoughts are causative. And so where we direct our consciousness, our awareness, our attention, our imagination, is what we are creating in the here and the now. Lex oriende, lex vivende. As we pray, we live. And so my invitation for each and every one of us today, every day, is to consider that story that is being told through us. And as a Abraham Maslow says, you will either step forward into growth or you will step back into safety. And growth is far more interesting, far, far more interesting than safety. We don't grow unless we leave it behind. And again, to quote Dr. Ernest Holmes to conclude this, one of my favorite uh, quotes of his from the Science of Mind text, page 282 for those keeping score, is this. To that person who can cast themselves into that infinite sea of receptivity, having cut loose from all apparent moorings from the past, to them, to them is the greatest reward. Thank you very much. Thank you.